So welcome, Kiara. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's an honor to be here again as part of the Admiral Residency with Pacific Contemporary Art at UH and also with Trades Artist in Residency. Um, aloha mai uh, I'm going to share a, a slideshow to kind of guide uh, visual references to the work I'll be presenting. And uh, just to give you a quick um, additional background, I'm an interdisciplinary artist with a uh, focus on film and new media art, but my practice is really hybrid in nature and spans multiple mediums, as you'll see throughout my talk. Um, and hopefully you'll see the connective threads uh, through all of the, the work. Okay, so I'm um, gonna start sharing my screen. Yes, hopefully we can be screen sharing. And, and I should say welcome everyone and we will have time for questions at the end. Um, so Karen, I will share a, a brief slideshow about her work um, and we'll talk a little bit and open it up. Um, it's a really casual format. Okay. Okay. Can everyone see <laughs> my first slide? Great. Um, so as mentioned, um, I'm also a, a curator and organizer, and I co-founded the artist-run venue Babe Lab in 2014 as a new media and transdisciplinary art space uh, with an emphasis on inclusion and experimentation. Um, and our arts program really aims to uplift critically underrepresented groups to create work, again, in media art and beyond. And this is within Oakland. Uh, so we're uh, at the edge of Chinatown, Oakland, near downtown. We also run artist studios uh, and host exhibitions, performances, screenings, and workshops. In terms of my personal practice, I wanted to share a few different projects uh, that I've worked on in the recent years. Uh, the first being CyanoVisions, which uh, really spanned two years of work as a research installation film and film project uh, that's very collaborative um, and as, as a project, it focuses on speculative mutualisms between cyanobacteria and humans in an age of climate collapse, um, and really aims to reposition the framing of other species, in this case, cyanobacteria, uh, and our interconnectedness with them. Uh, cyanobacteria were actually the first organisms to uh, create oxygen on the planet. They were the first to photosynthesize, so generating the oxygen that we breathe today um, in the atmosphere. And humans now generate the pollutants that kind of cause these, these toxic aggregations of cyanobacteria. So we're seeing this cyclical nature of them kind of coming into these, um, the forms of, of really what we saw in early earth or didn't see what was like originally um, these, these swaths of bacteria. So it's, it's really aiming to um, position how as humans, we, you know, we create new life forms through synthetic biology genetic engineering and such. Um, and the film is really kind of hoping to position potentials for uh, biological hybridity um, and recognize the inextricable relationship between humans and other creatures. So I'm just gonna play a short trailer of the film that's 15 minutes long, just to give you kind of a taste of it. And it's uh, co-directed by a uh, longtime collaborative of mine, Jody Stillwater. So um, this film has, has been integrated as a single channel video, also in various iterations of installation-based work with uh, 
different species of cyanobacteria um, being incubated in these photobioreactors that you could take samples of as a viewer and, and look at the different forms of their growth. Um, it was uh, different pigments were also integrated into bioplastics that were shown on display in different um, installation work and uh, as well as kind of magnified to show the different, um, the different forms they would take. Um, yeah, so it's, it's been shown kind of in multiple phases. This was at Isaiah in 2019, the International Symposium for Electronic Arts in Korea. And um, so again, my work is kind of between video, film and installation and kind of trying to push boundaries of, of how to use media, including like living, living media. Um, and just wanted to quickly say that with uh, Jody Stillwater, who co-directed uh, Santa Visions with me, we're also working on two films that we hope to release in the next few months. Uh, one is a short film that's also a music video for the artist Tyler Holmes. And the other one is a uh, short film with the, the performance artist Saturn Rising, or Saturn. Um, and our collaborative, our collaborative work really um, hopes to emphasize like a temporality, um, the language of nature and the elements, as well as to create psychic decolonial cinema and create future emergences of new symbolic gestures. Uh, moving into another body of work, um, I, I create bioplastics as a practice and have also created a website called the Bioplastic Cookbook for Ritual Healing from Petrochemical Landscapes which is really like a global offering to the community. It's available online as different protocols and methods for creating bioplastics with different bio-based polymers and biodegradable materials, um, as well as material examples, uh, visual examples, material philosophies, and uh, provocations to really think about shifting our material relationships as it relates to cons consumption and uh, aims to be reflective of the principle of aloha aina. So thinking about how we can create non-toxic materials uh, that we could use in our everyday lives. And um, again, I, I think of creating bioplastics as really this material process, it's a ritual process um, where I embed care and labor into the materials themselves. Um, and also it expands the time that you would take um, instead of just buying some plastic wrap out of the store, sometimes it takes uh, days to dry. You have to kind of create a solution, um, heat it into a liquid, um, pour it until it's a solid, and then again, wait a few days to dry. So um, extending the process of creating materials um, as opposed to using these petrochemical based um, materials that are extracted and creating by someone else's labor um, really aims to be a political gesture shifting away from global capitalism and what Prabhu Pilar terms the extractive scene. I also like to think of new ways of creating textiles. Um, and as my work is a bit speculative na in nature, thinking about you know, speculative fashion, um, the future of textiles and uh, the future of our species. And um, as I haven't quite made them scalable, they're not, it's not on a manufacturing level. It's, it's really aimed to be more of a provocation and an entry point for others to kind of riff off of these protocols and materials and really inspire others to create uh, their own work using these materials. So um, it's been really awesome to have um, this website up and then to have people kind of DM me with their own creations that they've made, usually kind of more advanced than mine. Um, and that's kind of really most exciting for me is to see um, others using these, these protocols and materials in their own artworks, or even like if companies reach out to me and they're like, oh, we're, we're starting to implement bioplastics into our, you know, into our um, kind of like material, um, you know, into the materials they use for their products. This is this is the aim of it. But I do also create sculptural based work and have shown it in installations. Uh, moving into another project. This is also a multi year project that uh, has spans kind of research and installation, and it's called Pelé and Plastiglomerate. 
Uh, Place Seglomerate, if you're not familiar, uh, was first defined and discovered by geologist Patricia Kokorin and sculptor Kelly Azvak in 2012 on Camilo Beach in Ka'u on the south point of Hawaii Island. And the heat from bonfires um, on beaches and uh, other kind of uh, sources of heat mixed together uh, sand, debris, and plas plastic debris um, that come, that wash up on the shores from the South Pacific gyre. Um, so it's really kind of like this global, um, these global plastics <laughs> and like the, this extension of, of global capitalism that wash up on the shores of Hawaii to create these kind of almost like monstrous kind of uh, conglomerates. Um, <clears throat> and uh, ge ge geologists were like really excited to find this like marker for the Anthropocene without really considering uh, the spiritual connections that the land or these, you know, these new materials might have uh, to the Kanaka Mali. And, you know, we believe that uh, the lava and the rock and the land is uh, part of the body of the living volcanic deity, Pele Honuamea, who resides in the mouth of, volcano, of the volcano Kilauea and uh, Hale Ma'u Ma 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 Crater, but really any of the lava on Hawaii Island is an extension of, of Pele's sacred body. And as Kanaka looking to Pele as our ancestor, you know, an extension of ourselves. So looking at plastic glomerate, um, as, an, as the invasion or melding of toxic or colonial and petrochemical substances with uh, the sacred and spiritual body of the land, almost a desecration. So um, I created an installation kind of focusing on these themes uh, for contact in 2019, which was shown here at the Hawaii Mission Houses, uh, which is a very tested space as being one of the first West style buildings um, to be built on Oahu and also has this legacy, you know, tied up in the missions and the dilution of Hawaiian spirituality. Um, so um, I was also positioning, uh, it was a two channel video that positioned um, the flows of, of lava uh, from Kilauea with uh, LIDAR and INSAR. Um, kind of satellite mapping of the, the craters. So as the craters really actively shoot lasers on the land to detect uh, surface deformations and protect the flows of lava or, or predict the flows of lava. Um, again, it's, it's kind of like this other additional invasion um, of the land. And so it's really aiming to juxtapose these, these two viewpoints, um, offering the bioplastics almost as like a whole coupure offering um, as they, they won't kind of meld, <laughs> they'll, they'll biodegrade, right? They're not gonna meld with the, the rock or the land. Um, and I think it's, it's important as we consider new ways of being and existing uh, with other species you know, in our world to, to really remember um, everything is interconnected, even, even those we consider not living. So the rock, it, it, it is alive. Um, and we really need to consider, you know, do we need necessarily a 30 meter telescope in addition to the 13 telescopes that are already on Mana Avakea? You know, it, it, it needs to, you know, we have to think about serving a mutualistic goal with the people on the land before we think of things like that. Um, moving on to a last project, I wanted to uh, mention uh, Kai Hai, which is a collaborative project with the artist Chin Chin Yi. And this explores also environmental issues, ind indigenous and immigrant stories across the Pacific Ocean through augmented reality and digital, re uh, digital uh, works. So the first was actually shown earlier this year uh, with Alpuni Space and uh, the the fashion show that they helped organize uh, for Nakeu of Vai. Um, and this was uh, shown as an augmented reality installation that was really aiming to honor uh, uh, the goddess uh, Hino Op Opuhala Koa, who is the goddess of the coral reefs. And uh, it can, she can really be spawned anywhere if you have the link um, on Instagram, it's just a filter really, and she can spawn. I, I feel like she prefers to be near the water. Um, and these are some different renders of the work. And uh, following this installation, we created another kind of speculative goddess um, who is 
from these submarine cables that connect the world with the internet, all the, the, this massive infrastructure that, you know, one of the first that was built connected Hawaii to the continent. So uh, we created uh, this, this GODEX as well as a, um, a dialogue between um, her Hina Opuhalakoa and Mazu, who's a, a Chinese sea goddess and kind of how technology has evolved over the past 1000 years. So this is on display now at Epoch Gallery. Um, it's just E-P-O-C-H dot gallery. And uh, also um, at WOW Gallery, W-O-A-W Gallery in Hong Kong. And lastly, I just wanted to say uh, during this month that I'm here, um, I, I'll be working on a new film that really uh, does focus on the more spiritual connection uh, to the land, to the Aina. Um, and I wanted to share some photos that I took last, um, that Jason Chu and I collaborated on uh, last time I was on the island. Um, this is in Palolo Valley. And this is with Lise Michelle and her brother, Sean. And uh, we wanted to really play with um, and explore kind of, again, the connection to the land, kind of the borders or the liminal spaces of the rainforest and the realm of uh, Vau Akua and the gods and kind of, Again, what is sacred? How do we visualize that? How do we remember that that's embedded in the land and the different layers and liminal spaces of the elemental that we need to continuously uh, pay reverence to or have reverence for and, and see as extensions of ourselves. So hopefully I didn't go too much over time. Thank you so much. So perfect. And um, I love your work so much. Uh, I guess we can, should we stop screen? Yes. <laughs> um, like, how do I do that? There we go. Um, so people can um, put questions in the chat or even just say you have questions and we'll like call on you and pop up. Um, I, I did want to um, ask you a few questions uh, in particular because um, I, I know you have a relationship uh, from being an undergrad with UH Manoa. So I just kind of wanted to ask you about that path from um, studying here in, in the art program and in the Bay Area to going to, you know, like ZKM and like Schloss Solitude in, in Germany and showing Korea. Um, so just telling us a little bit about your uh, sort of educational trajectory and inspirations along the way? Sure. I mean, I'm going to show my age here. So um, I, I attended UH Manoa like uh, right after graduation from Kamehameha schools in the er very early 2000s. Um, and yeah, I was, I was studying photography and film, but the film department at the time wasn't really built out. We were doing stop motion, kind of like taking images um, scanning film and then linking it together in Photoshop. So it was a really tedious process that um, students no longer have to deal with. Now everything's kind of digital. You have digital cameras that they can rent out. So I started really analog um, in the dark room. Um, and, and so I really think about composition um, from a photographic kind of standpoint, I think when I approach my film work and I, and I do like to kind of incorporate th that kind of um, yeah, that, that kind of lends uh, into the work. But um, yeah, I think just just seeking, um, uh, well, I, I, I relocated to the Bay Area and then continued my studies at San Francisco State University. Um, but I, yeah, and then a lot of work on my own, just a lot of, um, you know, working in the field of art. And um, I think I really learned a lot uh, founding Babe Lab and um, really, working on hands with different artists, installing work and, and seeing what was possible in terms of, um, again, interdisciplinary work and um, mixing different mediums. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I think of other artists who, um, especially women whose work, um, I think like lives in yours or echoes within it, um, like Mari Komori or Anika Yi in, in, in particular, like sort of coming from very different viewpoints, but also working within um, the cross between like sort of like filmmaking and myth and uh, biological work. I don't know, it just seems like a really rich, rich area um, and exciting area right now. Um, are there, I don't know, uh, sort of like, figures that that um that you'd speak to within that trajectory or tradition or um 
is there a way in which like there's a, a feminism to this uh to these projects as well sorry this is like a very complicated no question. um I, I feel like it's probably inherent in the work somewhat i feel like um yes but also i think you know growing up in hawaii i think the the hawaiian cosmology and worldview really kind of is maybe the most um like has has informed or influenced uh the work in the most way and then in terms of like the definition of feminism i think um i think it's it's more again seeing how uh everything is alive and and that um the ethics of care you know i think i think in that realm of feminism <laughs> that really interconnects with uh the Hawaiian worldview and cosmology is where, where I'm kind of coming from. We have uh, your collaborator, Ninea, with a much better phrased question than mine. Ninea, would you um, care to pop up and, and ask your question? Oh, yeah. Well, I, <clears throat> I, was hear I was sort of hearing a form of my question and what you were saying, Micah, about um, just like the bioplastics realm and like science realm sort of having these pathways into what you're talking about Tiare like some of the concepts behind your work like it it seems like fashion and it seems like contemporary installation but all of that is like guided by these like language principles mm -hmm. and I, I wonder if um, non-Hawaiians are they really like absorbed absorbing the culture through your work and, and it just seems so um like of the moment mm -hmm. so that yeah I just want to hear you talk about that mm. I mean I hope so <laughs> I think that's the aim um and again it's I've I've been off island um making a lot of this work as well so so it's interesting to create a, a body of work like Cyano Visions, where we filmed everything within California, um, but but looking for these these places and this kind of translating visual imagery to communicate um, kind of um, again the the aliveness of everything, the interconnectedness of everything that again traces back to uh, the culture of Hawaii and and kind of the the worldview that I grew up in. And I'm, I'm really excited to create work here, um, both with Trades and the Admiral Residency and uh, my, my uh, collaborator, Jody Stillwater, um, is coming out and we're also going to work on a, a short film that, that does, um, you know, will focus on the geography of Oahu and um, just really excited to kind of uh, bring in these, these images, um, of, of Hawaii into, into a visual narrative. And I think that that may, may translate a, a bit more, but again, the hope is to, um, yeah, to translate that in all the work. And again, really excited to work with you, Nanea, in terms of like creating these collaborative workshops and also br bringing together uh, different, different people from different practices and how they would like to translate uh, the culture and place into their work. Um, through language and sorry, I, I saw the beginning of your questions in terms of Olalo Hawaii and and again, I think I think it's a word a really good one for that translation, <laughs> right? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> but words can hold so much power, so I think it's important to always embed Olalo Hawaii, even if it's a word or a phrase, into the work because it holds so much, you know, generations of meaning and um, and lived experience and. Uh, just, just the the utterance of the words kind of echoes again throughout those generations uh, to the past and into the future. We have a great question from Erin. Uh, if you want to come up and, and ask it, that also kind of goes uh, leads into talking about kappa a bit and making parallels between your bioplastics and, and kappa. Yeah. Uh, hi, Tiari. Um, okay. I think this question is related to the last one that was just asked, but I was just thinking about. Um, the material practice of your work and the kind of like social ramifications or uh, social uh, potential of the material itself, um, as you were talking about bioplastics. And 
<clears throat> excuse me, and maybe how you relate that to COPPA? Yeah, I mean, I think ideally with bioplastics, you source everything locally. So there's one type of bioplastic you can make with agar agar or like this red seaweed. Um, so ideally you would source the seaweed locally, you would dry it, you would grind it up into powder and then you'd mix it with water and glycerol to create the bioplastic. But when I first started, I was using um, agar that was kind of made in ships from elsewhere. So it's, it's kind of, you know, it's a, it's a little bit of gets blurry when you're using also materials that are, are created and, and sourced elsewhere. So ideally, I think um, creating them with, with all local ingredients would be great. Um, and I see kappa as that, right. As, as gathering, uh, materials from the land and then bringing them into the studio and you're doing everything kind of you're sourcing you're putting care and labor into the materials and then they can speak way more to this than me as that is part of her practice um but but it is this engagement with the material where you there's care there's labor that's being brought into the creation of it and the transformation of it into uh this new existence so this textile or yeah um, we have a question from, from Kate uh, Langley, who maybe you can also ask her. Yes, I'll jump in. <laughs> well, <I've, clears throat> like everybody else, I think, Thierry, I think you started to respond to this as I was asking it, so maybe it's a little redundant now, but, but one of the things that has fascinated me about your work is the kind of um, engagement with um, virtual reality and augmented reality, mm. um, which can really complicate our sense of space and place um, because of the way that it can create spaces that don't exist or that are, you know, riffs on places that really exist. And yet, you know, some of your work is also very, very place focused. I think of that the plastiglomerate piece. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit more about your relationship and your work's relationship to those kinds of questions of, of place and space, because I think they potentially complicate ideas about space in interesting ways. Yeah, I would say, um, you know, the project Kai Hai, the last one that I, that I uh, showed was really um, conceived when both me and Chin Chin were missing home. So I was in California and she was in California and she's from Wenzhou in China and I'm from here. <laughs> and we were both like, how do we, how do we reconnect to, to our homeland? And what are the symbols or what kind of, we wanted to create these like trans-Pacific portals that could bridge space and time um, in a way. And augmented reality allows that, um, that you can pull up a sculpture on your phone and it can kind of, um, yeah, create this symbolic portal to another place. Um, so, so I really enjoy it as a medium, again, with kind of complicating <laughs> um, geography and, and what, you know, creating this like, other dimension of reality layered on top of our reality. Um, and I think it's, especially in, in creating, you know, speculative fiction or creating kind of like these new, um, like imagining new deities or how to visualize deities um, that exist. I think it's kind of a powerful medium in order to do that. And um, especially when histories get lost. So, so most people don't think of Hino, Hino Opuhala Ko'a when they're on the, the shores of Waikiki. You know, they're not thinking of uh, the, you know, this, this 1000 year old deity or longer who's been protecting the coral reef. So, so again, it's to kind of create this visualization of, of an entity that, that are, is out of people's mind. Um, and I think it's a powerful method of doing that. Um, in terms of VR, virtual reality, I think like, it can really allow an immersion into another world. Um, so there's a lot of potential to play with uh, what kind of stories you can create in that space and also how impactful that can be if you're immersing a viewer in a world versus them just watching it on a screen. It's more sensorial. It's like they, they have a more visceral experience to it. So um, I'm really excited to experience, for instance, the... Uh, Pico, uh, virtual installation, virtual reality installation at Honolulu Art Museum uh, by Christopher Kuhunahana and Nicole Naone, because they did an amazing job with uh, um, creating a VR experience with Mana Avakea. 
since we have Nanea here um, and we have such an exciting series of workshops coming up, would, would you like to speak um, a little bit about the process of putting that together? I'm so interested in the role of collaboration in your work um, and also each workshop uh, session, there's sort of mapping collaborative practices, language and expanded media, uh, and then on November 21st, idea sharing, world building, and mo ike, I think. And then November 28th, on site creation and visioning for the future. Um, it's such a rich uh, and sort of expansive series of, um, of opportunities for us. And it just seems really generous that you've like created this structure that, that, um, that we can participate in as well. I, I don't know if, if there's a way to speak to that. Um, and I suppose the, the curatorial practice and, and um, as part of your, your larger artistic practice. <laughs> yeah, so uh, the workshops coming up, we're really excited to, again, invite community to participate. Um, again, it's thinking about the process of collaboration um, and how to, um, again, bridge, bridge meaning. Um, there, there will be a workshop where we do look a, a bit more deeper into uh, the usage and of Alala Hawaii in, in, and embedding that into artworks. And then everyone mapping their own personal language kind of onto their, and histories into their work. So that could be like geographies of the island. So how do we bring place into the work? And, and really just kind of, um, you know, I think sharing both of our experiences working both in the with our respective practices and then hearing from others and how, how they work and um, finding, finding different bridges, collaborative bridges. Um, so I think the process will be unveiled. <laughs> it's meant to be really a collaborative process as a workshop as well. Um, and uh, yeah, and I, I believe uh, my collaborator Jody Stillwater will be here um, for the workshop. So we will talk a little bit about filmic language that we use um, Nanea, did you want to say anything? Well, yeah, it's going to be held at Grick, so everybody might be have been to the third floor courtyard, and it's a really dynamic space because there's a wide open sky from which you can be inspired by the Valley of Manoa, and kind of doing mapping exercises at first to figure out what collaborative projects could transpire throughout these workshop series. Um, people who have been dying to make something but have been held back by some of the technology skills that it would take to execute it should come to this workshop with that idea and be ready to talk about how they could be helped by people who work in film or work in um, installation and just talk about how to make their idea a, a bigger reality or a virtual reality, maybe. <laughs> I was just about to leave a comment um, in the chat about how inspired I am about the um, meta codes that we're creating in like translation or these codes that we create in translating a story for ourselves and then out into the world. Um, yeah, so... Um, more to come and it, it's going to really take everybody. It's not just going to be like me and Tiare only collaborating. It'll, it'll, I'm excited to see what everybody else brings to the table. And I think um, Brandy had a question about the sort of political um, and artistic uh, collaboration. So maybe if, if you'd like to ask your question. Oh yeah, sure. Mahalo, mahalo Tiare. Um, for, for your really wonderful presentation. Um, I really enjoyed seeing your work and, and hearing you um, talk about all these new materials. Um, and there's so many um, exciting possibilities, um, especially kind of like engaging with like indigenous futurities and futurisms. Um, um, so my question is also, I guess, just about, um, and I think you, you and, and Nanea touched upon this a little bit, um, but the processes of artistic collaboration, like how does the collaborative process be, you know, kind of happen for you? How does it develop? And, um, you know, have you seen these collaborations, these artistic collaborations kind of create like other spaces for, 
artist, activist, political solidarities, like between communities. Um, I'm interested in, in, you know, kind of the way in which art is able to then um, kind of work its way um, really organically into um, uh, social and environmental justice movements. So just just curious about this, because it seems like your, your work and a lot of your collaborative works have been so engaged with that. Yeah, um, I feel like a lot of the collaborative works kind of spawn organically. I think when you're called to create something um, and someone else is called, you know, in, in a similar direction, you, you will find a pathway to, to really kind of augment each other's practices. It's really, I see collaboration as a way to augment and support um, each other's vision through, um, you know, various skill sets that each person might have. So for Kai Hai, um, for example, um, Chin Chin, my collaborator, is very skilled at um, creating uh, 3D sculptures, 3D models, and uh, the augmented reality technology, like coding and everything else. Um, and I love storytelling. So I wrote this whole dialogue that we spoke together. I love, I have this background in fashion design. So we co-designed um, how these sculptures look together, pull different um, colors and, and materials for it. Um, so I think again, it's a, um, something that you're called to do and create. Um, and in terms of solidarities between communities, um, yeah, I wanted to mention um, Chin Chin was involved in this uh, walking tour uh, throughout Chinatown in San Francisco that um, where artists uh, created these augmented reality sculptures in front of storefronts in Chinatown, again, talking to the storefronts. Um, and this was at a time when there was, uh, there were, you know, there, there were these like uh, racial attacks um, last year and it was really again to highlight um these businesses that have been around a long time and really bring together and um create solidarity within the community um through these augmented reality sculptures uh that, that brought others into the into the neighborhood and were able to highlight again these different businesses and their strengths and their their histories and sometimes they involved interviews with the shop owners and i just think again when you're bringing together different artists with different skill sets. So there was, you know, a whole team that built out that walking tour. And then there were other artists who designed the sculptures and then you're working within the whole community. I just think there's so much power in that. So, you know, we're really excited to see um, what's going to be possible in Hawaii um, with our workshops and then to create um, again, the support network so we can share these skill sets, um, especially, you know, uh, different technical or digital skill sets with artists who feel like they don't have access to them and creating a collective in a way if we can, like I love who we. I am so excited that uh, it kind of kicks off our, our collaboration with you and, and um, welcome you to the department. I think we have time for maybe one uh, more question. Um, but I, before I forget, I also want to uh, thank uh, Trades uh, and the Citizen Diplomacy Action Fund and GRIC um, for hosting the workshops, because I think it's a really great opportunity for everyone to um, get to, to participate and to do to sort of make work together. Um, I think it's really an exciting opportunity and the Admiral Residency um, as well. So, uh, oh, another question from Aaron. Do you want to uh, ask and then uh, this might be the last one else. We have time for maybe one more. For that. I don't know. Go ahead. Sure. Thank you so much. <clears throat> um, I think I think I got the phrase right, TR. I think you said psychic decolonial cinema at the beginning of your presentation. And I was just um, <clears throat> struck by that phrase and its kind of relation to studies of the psychology of decolonization, thinking about theorists like Fanon and <clears throat> just one, was wondering if you could maybe expand upon what you mean by that a little more. Thank you. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I just dropped that casually into my talk. Uh, I definitely, I feel like with with the the filmic language uh, that that I use again with collaborator Jody Stillwater and our collective in uh, the Bay Area called Lenape, um, we just aim for for the language to be um, to to kind of 
psychic in, psychic cinema in the sense where you're kind of moved from the the mon, you know the mundane or neorealist kind of uh spectrum into something that's more of a dreamscape or a dream space um um and that's why I'm really interested in moike and like dream interpretation but but moving into the space where it's it's more symbolic in nature there's visual metaphor to show ways of connecting to again um the more liminal space spaces in nature um so it's not it's not just we're not just telling you what's happening it's not our traditional narrative it's more of this kind of like dreamlike psychic kind of visual language um and then the work itself um is always aiming to be decolonial in nature um through the stories through representation but beyond that and really um how how do we decolonize cinema right it's about the stories we're telling it's about the language we're using just using alala hawaii in in within a film is is decolonial um so i'm really excited about all of the the films that will be coming up at Hawaii International Film Festival this weekend. And um, I just think it's part of a movement. I'm not saying we're like, you know, um, but we're trying to be part of a movement of decolonial cinema and and just bringing in that spirit into all of the artwork that gets made, uh, whether it's personal work, collaborative work. Um, I just think... Um, even even contact again the um, exhibition that was curated by Josh Tengen and Ara Lelo in 2019 at the Mission Houses like that was a very decolonial gesture because you're using a site that's that has a deep colonial nature and you're inviting specifically um, Native Hawaiian artists to uh, create work there that's about um, Hawaiian spirituality or or you know post contact um, spirituality. So, and oh, that's where I first met Nanea. So <laughs> it all comes back around, but I hope that answered your question. So I think, uh, oh, and <laughs> more, more comments in the chat. Um, such a great, um, introduction to you, Tiara, and, and to this work. Um, thank you so much for being here and for sharing what you do with us. I'm so excited uh, to have you here this month and um, feel so grateful to have been able to speak with you today um, and, and meet you here. I wish we were in person because then we could uh, greet you a little um, a little better, but it's, it's so nice that we could do this um, and we'll see more of you very soon i guess um again workshop star uh november 18th um i think i put the link to to register for them here you can pass that on also it's open to anyone right like students and people you can pass this on to not just the grads but um anyone who might be interested uh and um yeah any last <laughs> comments before we start to see you around in the department um, yeah, I think the talk is recorded. So if anyone wants to share it uh, with other people, um, I believe, yeah, we'll have a link up shortly that we can share with people. Um, yeah, because we can't generate one now. <laughs> I think we have to like stop the recording, and get the link. But um, yeah, and then in terms uh, of the workshop dates, uh, 11, 18, 11, 21st and 11, 28th. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Thank you so much, everyone, <laughs> for joining and for having me. Yeah, we're really, really thrilled. And thank you to everyone who's who's made it possible. It really has taken kind of a village to get um, to get here. So uh, the Admiral Residency, Trade, Citizen Diplomacy, Action, Greg, um, Yuch Manoa, everyone involved. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you.